Well, good evening. How are you? Well, My name. Well, that's good. Okay, so let's practice our old. Good evening. Uh, it was very good. My name is Prentice Lee, and I'm the superintendent at Community High School District 128. And on behalf of the Board of Education and Administration in District 128 and at Libertyville High School and Vernon Hills High School, we want to welcome you to the second of two public uh, presentations and overviews on uh, proposed capital plan um, work that the district has uh, been working on for a number of years uh, to get us to this point and through a number of uh, iterations of uh, school board members on the school board. And so it's really a compilation of work of a number of people over a period of time. Before we begin this evening, I just want to introduce a few people to you. Um, first of all, our primary spokespeople for the Board of Education tonight, uh, Jim Batson is the board vice president, and Scott Luce is one of our board members, and they are right here. And several of our other board members have chosen to attend tonight, uh, but they are here as private citizens tonight, and they are not representing uh, the Board of Education tonight. So we have, uh, let me introduce them all, make sure I get them, and then uh, we'll give them all a round of applause. So up front here, you guys can just wave. We have Lisa Hessel, and in the back we have Kevin Huber, and in front of Kevin we have Karen Lundstedt, and uh, who am I missing here? Casey. Oh, Casey, where is Casey? I didn't see Casey. And hiding in the middle there is Casey Rooney, and I think I got all the board members. Uh, our board president, Pat Grudy, uh, was really disappointed he could not be here tonight, uh, but he is on a long planned trip with one of his daughters on a father-daughter uh, week uh, while she's home for vacation. That was planned well before um, we had the presentation tonight. So, um, you know, Pat gives you his regrets uh, for not being here tonight. We also have several people from um, kind of our support team uh, that has been working with us on our uh, capital planning. And so um, Mike Henderson is here from STR. They are the district architects. And Mike, Skyler, Skyler, I forgot your last name. Okay, so Mike and Skyler uh, are here. Jeff Masters is here from Gilbain and they are construction managers uh, for us. And then um, Mark Koopman is our director of buildings and grounds here. Uh, Mark uh, has great exper expertise in this area. And then uh, moving over here, we have Dan uh, Stanley is our Director of uh, Assistant Superintendent for Finance um, in the district, and Rita Fisher is our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction. Brian Kelly is our Associate uh, Superintendent. I see we have the amazing Mick Torres here tonight. Mick's our District Director of Technology. And uh, if I've gotten everyone else, and we always save the best for last, and that's Mary Todrick, who is Director of Communication and has a large part in all of you actually being here tonight. So uh, thanks. To, so let's just give everybody a round of applause from the beginning, and we can get rolling. Okay, so here's what we want to do tonight. Uh, we're going to spend a little time talking with you um, and reviewing uh, our proposals that we've been working on for a number of years in the capital uh, arena. Um, and beyond that, we want to talk a little bit about what those proposals are uh, and the projects are, uh, the rationale for those projects, um, what those projects uh, look like. Basically, both the principals will be talking to you uh, tonight about that. Um, and then uh, we want to talk about the financial end of this. And then uh, we're going to take some questions. So the one thing I do want to remind you tonight, this is not a regular board meeting. So if you, have, uh, you want to have some interaction with the board on some other issues like the budget and the tax levy and things that are very important to the district, uh, they should really be addressed at a regular board meeting. Uh, this is really an overview and a presentation and attempt to ask your, answer your questions about this tonight. So with that said, we're going to jump in and, and uh, we know from last week we'll be, you know, 50 minutes to an hour on the presentation and then uh, we want to take the questions that you have, okay? So the most important thing that you need to know about these projects are, okay, they're going to require no referendum, they're going to require no borrowing and no interest payments, and that's really important because anytime we borrow money, just like we do at home, we have to pay interest, and on the type of money that we're talking about here, those interest payments would be very, very high, so we won't be required to borrow. And uh, let's just roll right in, Dan. So we tried to frame this tonight around some frequently asked questions, if you will. So I'm going to run through these real quick, and then we're going to come back and talk about these for a few minutes. So um, what work is being proposed and why? 
what are the costs of the work, when will the work start and be completed, how will it be funded, what is the impact to the cash reserves that the district has, and what is the potential impact. So I'm going to start and kind of do the overview on those questions, and then we're going to bring John uh, Gilliam up, the principal at Vernon Hills, or Tom uh, Calentis, the principal at Libertyville, and then John, principal at Vernon Hills, and then uh, Dan will talk about finances. I'll kind of wrap us up and take us in uh, to questions. Okay, so first of all, what work is being proposed and why is it being proposed? The District 128 Board and Administration have been assessing and reviewing long-term Libertyville High School and Vernon Hills High School capital needs for approximately five years. In the past few years, the Board has completed assessment, prioritized needs, and reviewed options to meet those needs. All current and or proposed projects will be paid for from existing cash reserves and will require no borrowing on the part of the school district. The highest priority was replacing the current, soon to be old LHS pool and adding more on-campus parking at LHS as part of that project. With significant current cafeteria needs at Vernon Hills High School and continued rising enrollment at Vernon Hills High School, expanding the student cafeteria, adding additional classrooms and a STEM lab and adding a second co competitive gym there like the West Gym at LHS uh, became priorities. Based on current rising enrollment and future enrollment projections at VHHS, the board is considering a conservative approach to the addition of classrooms with future options to add more classrooms if our enrollment projections continue to exceed expectations. At LHS, completion of the new swimming pool, which has already been approved and obviously under construction if you've driven by LHS, the work is expected to be completed on the LHS swimming pool in the spring of 2019. A parking lot addition already approved and under construction uh, would add an additional 68 parking spots on the west side of the property um, was approved by the board and the village of Libertyville. These additional spots are much needed for the LHS campus, not only during the day, but for after school and extracurricular um, events. Repurpose the current and soon to be old LHS pool, which is currently one of the proposals under consideration. That would uh, result in a multi-purpose physical education and extracurricular uh, activity facility. This building and space at LHS is important for both curricular needs, the regular PE curriculum, and extracurricular needs as well. At VHHS, expanding the cafeteria is under consideration as part of the capital project's proposals. The existing cafeteria is at least half the size that it should be for a high school the size of Vernon Hills High School. As a result, the cafeteria space must be expanded into the front lobby and the lunch periods are scaled back to only 22 minutes in length. Dr. Gilliam will explain in more detail in a bit how that impacts students very differently at VHHS from the students at LHS. The expanded cafeteria and remodeled servery will be able to better accommodate the current and expected increase in students over the next few years. Eight classrooms and a STEM lab. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And those classrooms in the STEM lab are currently under consideration as well. An analysis of classroom usage was completed to determine the current and future needs for classrooms at VHHS. The proposed new STEM lab and classrooms will be able to accommodate both changing curriculum needs and increasing enrollment in uh, the future years. And finally, a second gymnasium and dance studio, also under consideration as part of the capital projects. Currently, VHHS has the same curricular and extracurricular programs as Libertyville High School, and as such has the same space needs. The second competitive gymnasium and dance studio will be able to accommodate all of these needs and provide for increased enrollment. So what are the cost totals for each campus and overall? At LHS, already approved by the board and under construction, the new LHS swimming pool and the LHS parking lot addition, total cost for both of those projects already approved $22.5 million. Under consideration, repurpose the current soon-to-be-old LHS swimming pool. The total estimated cost is $5 million, which brings a total estimated cost for all projects at LHS 
to $27.5 million. At VHHS, under consideration, expansion of the cafeteria, addition of eight classrooms and a STEM lab, and addition of a second competitive gymnasium. Total estimated cost for all projects at Vernon Hills High School, $26.6 million. When will the work be started and completed? If approved in, uh, by the board, projects would be bid at the end of January with bid awards at the end of February. To hit applicable construction cycles, project work would begin late spring at both campuses. Tentative project completion dates are projected to be as follows. At LHS, spring 2020. At VHHS, fall 2020. How will the project be funded? It will be funded 100% from ca existing cash reserves. As noted earlier, it will require no referendum and no increased taxes to fund these projects. In addition, since we are not borrowing money to fund the projects, there will be no interest payments as well. What is the impact on existing cash reserves? Existing cash reserves without early taxes is $80 million minus the 54.1 million for the two projects, so that's the 27.6 and um, the 26.6 um, equals $25.9 million left in reserves. That is a 30% fund balance as a percentage of operating expenses. Illinois recommends a minimum 20% cash reserve. 20, I'm sorry, 25% cash reserve. Thank you for the correction, Scott. I was waiting for Dan to jump in there. So let me say that again. The state of Illinois rec recommends a minimum of 25% cash reserve. Does the board plan to build the cash reserves up again? This is a question that we received earlier um, at last week's session. And the board is committed to leveling the cash reserves around the 30% level, or in other words, maintaining the reserves around the 30% level. The school board over the last seven years has had uh, a number of conversations about the appropriate level for the cash reserves, and that has wound its way down from 60 to 50 to 40, back up, and then back down to the 30% level. But given what we know right now, we believe that's a comfortable place and a reasonable place for the district to be. There is still a great deal of uncertainty in Illinois around school financing and funding including the percentage of state funding going to public education, potential pension cost shift from the state to back to local districts, and the possibility of a property tax freeze. After years of discussion by several iterations of the board, the board has, again, reached consensus around the 30% cash reserve level. Finally, the past few and the current board, past few boards and the current board, have committed to not use cash reserves to pay for regular operating expenses. So what's a potential tax impact to taxpayers of the proposed projects? There is no tax impact. District 128 has no outstanding debt. There is no uh, debt incurring to pay for any of the proposed projects. Thus, there will also be no interest payments. And as we noted at the beginning of the presentation, those interest payments can be substantial over time. If you think about um, your 30-year, if you have a 30-year mortgage when you get, first get the mortgage, and then if you have the mortgage the whole 30 years, what you've paid in interest over the course of time is probably roughly three times of what you originally borrowed. So interest payments are no, um, you know, no small item. So I'll have a few more comments when we wrap up tonight, but that's a basic overview, uh, kind of the who, what, when, where, and the impact um, potentially on local taxpayers. So at this time, I want to introduce you to Dr. Tom Calentis, and Tom's a principal at Libertyville High School, and he's going to walk you through the Libertyville uh, part of the uh, projects. Tom? Good evening. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. For Libertyville, our um, construction projects have largely begun, and we would be um, proposing tonight to kind of finalize our third phase of a large scale master plan for the building. So as you know, we have been uh, working very hard on our new aquatic center, which um, is going to be right out on the front of the school along 176. Um, the project is coming along very well. 
most of the exterior is complete and work is going on on the interior of the building. Um, we will be putting in there a um, 50 meter pool. It's eight lanes and it's got two bulkheads. And what the bulkheads allow us to do is set the pool at different sizes and um, to sort of allow for multiple usage at the same time. Um, we would have um, PE classes using it during the school day, of course. We would have our IHSA boys and girls swimming and diving teams, our boys and girls water polo teams using it. But our pool is um, the most heavily utilized facility at Libertyville High School, used virtually seven days a week um, throughout the day and evening because we also host a large amount of community swim groups as well, including our learn to swim groups and some of our senior swim groups that utilize the pool. Um, this obviously would be um, a, a large facility that would be shared both by the school and by our larger Libertyville community. The cost is approximately $21.5 million. Um, this is currently under construction, and right now, depending on the winter and how the construction goes, we're looking at March to April as a window of time when we're anticipating it opening in 2019. Okay. With that, um, as you know, especially if you are a senior, we have had a historical um, issue with parking and traffic congestion on Libertyville property. So we were able to work with the village, with our neighbors, with our community, and with our school board to uh, find ways to have some additional parking put in on our campus. This is gonna be along the west side of our campus, along the west side of the um, new construction. And it adds, Dan, do we have a visual on that? There it is. It adds uh, approximately 69 new spaces, plus it restores 40 spaces that were lost for the construction of the pool. So all in all, it's about 109 spots that are going in, 40 that are being returned, 68 new ones that we never had. You see it creates this uh, driveway and parking area along the west side. The, there will be an entrance. If you're coming west on 176, you'll be able to turn in. And that goes through the campus, connects to the north end of the uh, parking lots. Um, this is approximately a million dollars. Much of the digging and excavation has already occurred. And in the spring, when temperatures begin to warm, they will go in and they will finish um, all of the paving. We anticipate that this parking lot will be complete um, around the same time as the pool in the spring of 2019. And then that leaves us our third phase, which we're proposing tonight, which once we have our new pool, we will then have an old pool, which is just right down our hallway. And that's about um, 16,000 feet of space that would be sitting right in the heart of our building. And so um, what we have done is we have said, basically one of the first things that I was asked to do when I became principal here last year was to form a committee and to work on a plan for what would become of the old pool. To do that, we formed a committee that really looked um, at the entire building. We wanted to look at the entire campus and we wanted to think about a master plan. And what we did was we went through a process of identifying what are all the student needs and the instructional needs in our building. We created a, a, a lengthy list. We worked with um, administrators, with teachers, with coaches. We looked at that list and we began to prioritize based on that what were the things that we felt were the most important needs and things that were kind of moving down the list in terms of priority. Once we arranged that, we had our top kind of list and our, our facility needs, we then worked with the architects of STR and we said, okay, given that space, what would be the most appropriate use of that space to meet our building needs? How does the needs that we have get served by this space? And after some further conversation and discussion, we came back with a plan to actually take the pool, which is right now really one level, and we have a plan to divide it into two levels um, and to have about 8,000 
uh, feet of space on the bottom and about 8,000 square feet of space on the top. The bottom would be a dance uh, um, studio that would be used for our PE classes during the school day for dance and for our yoga and Pilates during the school day. So the downstairs, essentially what would happen is the entire north wall of the building would be ripped out and the pool, which is like a concrete vessel. Sorry, I forgot we're being taped, so I have to stand at the mic. This is very constraining for me. I'd like to move around. Oh, I could take the mic with me. No, this is dangerous. All right, so we will be taking out this north wall here, and then the pool vessel is like a big concrete kind of box. And so we would be removing the pool. Obviously, we'll drain the water, we'll go right into Butler Lake, right? And we tear out then the pool, and we expand the walls just a little bit. We raise the floor of the, the basement, and we reconstruct it as a dance studio. It's about 4,400 square feet of space for dance. And what we would have is we would have the boys' locker room, which is there right now on one side. There would be access to the dance studio from the boys' locker room. The girls' locker room is up at the top. That's the existing girls' locker room. There would be access to the dance studio from the girls' locker room. There would be office space for the dance instructors. And there would be storage spaces for dance and yoga and PE equipment all around that space in there. The floor would be a floor that is designed for dancers. It would be a sprung floor, which means you're building it off of the concrete. It has a, a little bit of a give for, for dancers. And we would put on there um, a professional dance floor, uh, like a Harlequin floor, which is something that is um, kind of what's used in the dance industry to protect dancers. The outside area would be a vestibule with windows where the dancers would leave their bags or their shoes um, because the floor would be protected for just their use. In there would be mirrors, bars, and any of the technology that is necessary for PE and yoga during the day. And just so you understand, we anticipate that this studio would be used all eight periods of the day because we have multiple dance sections and multiple classes of yoga and PE. So essentially from set, uh, 8.45 till 3.30, it would be used for um, academic instruction. And then after school, it would be used for our dance teams, which um, practice from August through about February. And then we would also have, after that, we have our musicals. They would be able to practice there. Our orchestra's performances and all of our extracurricular dance would utilize this studio. Um, Dr. Lee will talk a little bit later about the sheer number of dancers that we have in the district and how important this studio is for them. The upstairs then, um, where the existing pool deck currently is, would be created as one solid floor and we would have a multi-purpose PE, athletic, and extracurricular space. This would be a space for maximum flexibility and usage for multiple sports and clubs throughout the year and other school events. So during the school day, we would be using it all day long for PE classes. Then after school, during the winter, we anticipate it would be utilized for wrestling. But in the fall and in the spring, we would probably be using it for dance to utilize as well as many of our extracurricular clubs, like our um, fencing team, our robotics teams can have competitions in here. If we host a big school event like a debate tournament and things, we would have a multiple uh, use space that we could house a large number of students in. Um, the other thing is during our musical and orchestra season, this would be a space that would be available for overflow dancers and extra dance practice and usage. So both spaces, the downstairs and the upstairs would be used all during the school day and all throughout the evening for extracurriculars. Um, anticipated for this is approximately $5 million. Um, you can see these are some cutaway views here. Uh, this top one is uh, looking to the north, so you're looking out towards the north parking lot. We preserve the windows that look out onto Butler Lake up at the top, 
And down in the dance studio, we have an, a way to add storage, yet still build in windows for natural light. And then this cross section here kind of just shows you some of the spacing of it. Um, the exciting part of this is because we're taking the existing building, we're not building a new structure. We are refurbishing the existing building. The contractors believe that if we could start it this May, right after school is out, we would basically start the next day. Uh, the project would be completed in the spring of 2020. So we would need a year for construction and we would be ready to go the following year after that. And I think that's it for me. I'm gonna introduce my colleague, Dr. John Gilliam from Vernon Hills High School to talk about their projects. Thank you, Tom. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Prentice. I uh, feel like I'm back home. 1994, I started teaching here as a math teacher, became a math department supervisor. Then we built Vernon Hills, and I headed there. So uh, I, feel, I feel like I'm home. This, this wall to wall orange carpet was on the walls when I left back in uh, 98. It's good that you kept that. Yeah, it's nice. <clears throat> All right, so here's what we know at Vernon Hills. Uh, the students are coming. Many of them are there. We know uh, for a few reasons. John Casarda is a demographer that we've been working with uh, in the district for over a decade. And uh, his firm has, um, has forecasted this for years. Uh, and not only that, we see it at Hawthorne. If you are a member of the community in Vernon Hills, you know that politically you just voted for a referendum because the students that Casarda had been telling us we're coming are here. They're already in the middle schools and elementary schools. Uh, that district is in a pinch and, as you know, uh, is ready to build. Um, we also know that because of our own internal projections. We can put a name to every little face in Hawthorne 73, and uh, we can tell you which of those kids are gonna go to Stevenson, which are gonna come here, which are gonna go to Mundelein, uh, and a vast majority are, are coming to Vernon Hills. So our own internal projections kind of confirm what both of those other pieces of data uh, have said. So they're coming, we know that. Uh, that has led us to an evaluation of what we do as a building, much like Tom has done here in this school. We've looked at our programs, uh, curricular programs, extracurricular programs, uh, what our staff is doing in the building, what our community is doing in the building, and put together a plan that I want to address with you now. This gets into the numbers of students a little bit deeper, just in case uh, you are interested. This, this blue line in the pink box is our historical um, enrollment. So you look at the last 10 years, and our students have wavered between, you know, 1308 at a bottom spot uh, and 1500, you know, along the last 10 years until you get right now and you can see the trend, right? The trend right now is going up, and this year we have 1490 in terms of students. Right, and uh, when you look at what's going to happen in the next year, next ten years, well, we're going to go up. The question is for us, how much? And so this Casarda firm has given us three projections: A, B, and C. A is not shown; it's his most conservative one that we don't think uh, is anywhere in the picture. But this B projection is a, um, a more, he would say, realistic or moderate projection. And in, by the end of uh, 10 years, gets us at about 1,600 and a half, 1,650. If you look at his most aggressive projection, that gets us up over 1,800 in 10 years. Uh, now, when we look at our own numbers, we pretty much think we're somewhere in the middle. Uh, maybe not as high, probably not lower than 16 and a half. Uh, but if you look at the kids in the seats in Hawthorne, we're at about 1650. You start to add in, all right, what are they doing south at 45? What's going at the Cuneo? What are they going to do with that mall? Are they putting more residencies in there? We're going to be somewhere in the middle, all right? So, uh, knowing that, again, like Tom and his crew did here, we have put together a plan. We've done some uh, facility utilization assessment. 
Uh, again, some analysis of program, extracurricular, and curricular. Uh, determine kind of a list of needs. Dr. Lee mentioned what those uh, are, and I'll show you in a second. Uh, but we've been in concept design plan for quite some time. Actually, our gym and dance facility, and I'll touch on this when I get there, has been uh, planned for over a decade, but in more detailed concepts since 2014. Uh, and then our cafeteria expansion and um, classroom expansion uh, has been concepted and then planned in detail from 17 on. I just do want to mention the groups that have been in place. We have put thousands of man hours into this. I don't know if you're sitting in your chairs wondering how much time has been put into this plan, but between district leadership Building leadership, so that's department supervisors, uh, assistant principals, principals, teachers involved in the process. It's been fun to have students involved, visiting other schools, trying out uh, different cafeterias and different ways to cook food, so on and so forth. Uh, and then our design professionals, some of them here today, uh, literally over thousands of hours into this project. So let's talk about each of these three quickly. The cafeteria expansion, don't know if you've ever been inside Vernon Hills High School, uh, but oftentimes when guests walk in or even uh, you know, a substitute teacher come, comes in for the first day, the first thing that they say is, wow, is this your cafeteria? This seems kind of small. Uh, and in fact, it is. Um, one of the things that we kind of joke around about is this idea that it was uh, value engineered or reduced in scope when the building was first built. But the reality is it's a small cafeteria. So over the years we have tried to accommodate. Uh, this part right here is actually built into our foyer. So we added the cafeteria into the foyer. Not in the picture right now, but there's some tables that we've put in around the pool and some of the other areas just to accommodate some of the overflow. But the reality is this. Libertyville students have 50 minutes to eat. And that's great, that's what they should have. 45 minutes now that we've shortened periods a little bit with this later start. Vernon Hills kids have to go uh, half periods because there's just not enough room to get them in. So we have eight half period lunches. So kids are eating right now 22 minutes. Bell rings, they scurry off, a new crew comes in. That crew has somewhere less than 22 minutes, probably closer to 20 by the time uh, the bell rings and they're in line. Uh, and that's a problem. And um, you talk to kids, you talk to parents, uh, and that's something that we want uh, addressed. Um, furthermore, we're adding students. So that problem becomes exasperated as we add students into the mix. And so we have uh, worked on a solution to an effect, like Dr. Lee said earlier, double the size of our cafeteria. Uh, and I'll show you this, but we are gonna move to full 45 minute lunch periods and in effect add twice the amount. So in gray right here, this was kind of the picture I just showed you. These kids all kind of slammed in this area. But we're gonna expand that area into our courtyard. If you've ever been at the school, you realize it's a square, and in the middle of the square is a courtyard. So we have the opportunity to build into the courtyard. So this, all this that is just colored without gray is actually new construction in the courtyard. This right here is what is now the current servery, and so you can tell that we are going to widen that servery out, give it a more open feel, put our food stations on the outside, and in effect double the size of the servery at all, I mean, uh, as well. All right, that's our plans with the cafeteria. Uh, the gym dance in studio at Vernon Hills. So when you look at the gym and dance programs um, at at Vernon Hills and Libertyville, they're almost exactly the same, right? In our gym and dance uh, facilities, we have extracurricular as well as curricular. We have community in, in, the, in the building often. Um, and let me just throw a few numbers at you. Our curricular program right now is at 100% capacity uh, for part of the year. We have a gymnastics gym that is used for gymnastics well over half of the school year in the winter and in the spring. Uh, and when that, when that uh, facility is in use, our curriculum program is at 100% capacity. We have six courses using the field house and gym. We have three courses using the weight room. 
and three dance courses. Right now, our dance courses, when that gymnastics gym is being used, they get bounced everywhere. They get bounced to the studio theater stage. They get bounced to the auditorium stage. Uh, they get bounced to a bay in the field house, for example, when it might uh, have a little smaller class, perhaps, to, to go along with. So the dance classes are being moved all around. And in short, uh, we have 100% capacity during the day when that gymnastics gym is being used for gymnastics. In addition, our athletic pr uh, program mirrors that of, of Libertyville's. So back in the mid-2000s, 2008, 9, both Vernon Hills and Libertyville started a plan to add a new competition gym and locker room space. Uh, that's what Libertyville now calls its West Gym, because that gym was built. But at that time, the housing market crashed. We put our gym on hold, so we have a locker room, and if you walk up into our building, you'll know that there's a locker room that just kind of sticks out without a home. That's because what was next to it was supposed to be a gym that never got built. So we're proposing that that's get, that gets built really for these reasons. One, we have the same athletic programs, the same needs that Libertyville does, uh, and these numbers right here demonstrate that. In the winter, five courts, so three in the field house, two in the gym, are used by 12 athletic teams. So that's all the basketball teams, uh, that's all the cheer, dance, so on and so forth. Early in the spring, 19 teams used those five courts. Uh, so what amounts to then all day usage from 6.30 through 10 o'clock at night, those facilities are being used. When you add on to that, all that we want our athletic facilities to be able to house, so that's everything from intramurals to community feeder sports to open gyms to uh, the Cats Aquatics dry land, dry land exercises, so on and so forth, uh, the space is packed and uh, we've decided that we would like to add some more to it. Again, if you walk to the front of our, uh, front of our school, there's uh, a green space in front of the pool. That's where we are proposing that we would build the second competition gym. Again, it's the exact same footprint as the West Gym uh, at Libertyville High School, and my guess is we'll call it the West Gym of Vernon Hills High School because it is on our west side. But it's the exact same footprint. It's got one main competition floor, and then you can put a, um, a divider across the middle and go two smaller um, courts, you know, volleyball courts, basketball courts, with bleachers on one side. Um, no locker room space here because under our dance facility uh, is the locker room. So if you look at our school right now, there is a locker room already built, and when STR designed that uh, almost a decade ago, they built the steel in there because the plan was to put a dance facility on top of that, and so now we're just following through with those plans and just sticking that roof over it and putting a dance facility here. And the things that Dr. K said about the floor, the usage, uh, the number of dancers, all of those things are the same. So between this space and this space is this storage space. So those two spaces are the same. First floor, second floor will have some changing rooms, not a locker room. There won't be a sink or a toilet uh, or any kind of plumbing expenses that go in there. It's just a changing room. So that's our gym and dance studio. Again, here's the picture. So as you look at our school now, this is the existing um, locker room that's already there. We're just going to build the dance facility on top of it. And then this is the, po or this is the pool behind that gray uh, concrete structure, and the gym will sit out in front of it. So that's looking from the west. Uh, that's looking from basically what would be our football stadium kind of down the hill. Let's talk a little bit about the classroom addition that we are proposing. Nine curricular departments in our school, several, three of them are uh, elective areas. Five of them, the core instructional areas in PE, are packed. So when we talk to, to uh, architects about what it means to be at capacity, they say any time you get to about 85% capacity in uh, an instructional area, you start to feel tight, which means that you plug courses into the, the uh, schedule matrix, not on what's best for kids, but on where we can just shoehorn classrooms in. 
Uh, you start to have to mess around with things like study halls, things like electives, so on and so forth, to try to accommodate uh, this tight kind of atmosphere we have. And like I said, five of our curricular departments now are about 90% or higher um, in room utilization. So I look at a master's schedule and uh, of let's say world languages, I try to find an open room to slide a Spanish two course in and there is just almost virtually no space. Right, so I end up having to move them into a social studies area, that kind of thing. So the numbers don't lie. Five departments at or over 90%, we're tight. Um, we've had some comments, of, well, wasn't this, the high school built for about 1,600? And uh, perhaps, but we have had some considerable changes in programming, uh, namely special ed programming. So when we built the high school, special ed law was such that we had uh, a smaller set of, of students, a uh, smaller number of them, percentage-wise, special ed. Uh, the needs in terms of space and constraints were smaller but we've got an expanding special ed program like Dr. Calentes would have here, which means that they need uh, proportionally a much greater number of classrooms uh, into the instructional space like we haven't had before. We've had some program shifts that have led to this idea of a STEM. Um, you know, back when uh, Vernon Hills was built, we had eight sections of woods and autos. We still have those programs, we still have those spaces, but fewer kids are taking those, and more kids are taking upper science classes, computer science classes, um, development classes like web development, app development, those kinds of things, which have led to this push in STEM, uh, which is why we're proposing a STEM lab, uh, our solution to this ad in students and this need for instructional space then is to uh, go on a conservative line. Like Dr. Lee said earlier, the, the architects have said, look, we think you need somewhere between 8 and 16 classrooms. Um, and so we're going to stay on the conservative side, ask the board to build 8 classrooms, two of them science labs, six of them instructional classrooms, and then uh, an additional science lab that we're calling a STEM lab. So that lab will be used for science classes as well as some of these upper research type classes that uh, we're offering in the high school now. This is a look uh, at the addition from the northeast corner. So that's basically looking at it from CDW. All right, there's uh, the classrooms here and the STEM lab out in front of it. Here's another look directly at it. Again, classrooms here, STEM lab in front of it. One more look. Here's a floor plan look of the high school, kind of an aerial look. So again, the gym is out on the west southwest side corner. The cafeteria kind of built into uh, the courtyard, and then the instructional wing off the northeast side right next to CDW. Uh, as Dr. Lee said, we're talking about using reserves uh, close to the amount of $26.5 million. Uh, we'd love to get this bid going now so that we can start building in May as soon as we graduate with the hopes that uh, students will be eating in a new cafeteria, uh, participating in a new gym, and taking classes in a new wing by the fall of 2020. Thanks. Okay, just want to spend um, a couple minutes talking about board and stakeholder design planning. Um, as John and Tom have mentioned, from 2014 to real, 2014 to the current time, uh, there have been dozens of board meetings and board committee meetings. So I mentioned in uh, my opening comments that this really goes back five to seven years, the planning on this, and it covers several iterations of the board. Um, who have looked at this um, over the years. So this has been something that's been worked on repeatedly, not only at the two building levels, but considered at the board uh, level as well. There have been uh, more than 60 stakeholders involved in that process at both buildings and working with the board. There have been six separate design teams and then more than 50 design team meetings. So here are a couple of things that are important to note. 
Our history in this district, going back many, many years, is that we build good, usable facilities. We build nice facilities, but we do not build Taj Mahal facilities in this school district. Uh, we, uh, the district has never believed, and we don't believe, uh, that that's an appropriate use of taxpayer resources. So to use a swimming pool as an example, to do a 50-meter pool, we first um, did a design, and Mike and the crew began to um, feed numbers back to us. That pool came back at 20 or $29 million. And so over the course of two months, it was value engineered down to $21.5 million. So we cut basically seven, eight million million um, out of what was pretty close to a $30 million project. And what we're gonna get as a result of that is a nice pool, a very functional pool, but it's not a Taj Mahal pool. And that fits into um, our model here. So all of these projects have gone through some level of value engineering uh, as we have worked internally and then we've worked with the board and John and Tom and uh, Bryant and Dan and uh, our professional uh, support people that have worked with us on this have done a great job uh, in terms of doing that. Um, and that's very important to know. So Dan, if you want to move to the next slide. So uh, let me introduce Dan Stanley, who's our Assistant Superintendent for Finance, and Dan's going to talk a little bit uh, about the financials uh, on this, and then I'm going to come back and I'll have some closing comments, and then we'll take some questions, okay? Dan. Good evening. Happy to be here. I'm just kidding. Hi, how are you doing? Do we need to stretch? I know this is this is a lot of fun. All right, uh, so let's talk financials uh, for a few minutes. Um, so really, what we're trying to do is kind of break these into two ideas because we're talking about a lot of different things are happening. Some of these projects that we're talking about are already bid approved, shovels in the ground, like we're, we're those are going. Um, but then we're also talking about separate projects that we're looking to propose that we would like to do. Uh, so looking at the ones that are already done under construction, shovels in the ground, uh, the LHS Aquatic Center coming in at 21.5, not to exceed 21.5 million. It won't, will it? It's not going to, we're fine. Um, LHS parking lot uh, at, about, at no more than $1 million for a total of projects that are currently under construction. Again, bid, approved, shovels in the ground, um, $22.5 million. Then really the projects that we're kind of showing that are new is uh, the work at uh, this building, LHS, the old pool renovation, approximately $5 million. And for the Vernon Hills, um, expanding the cafeteria, the gym and dance facility, and the uh, classroom addition coming at about $26.6 million. So when you total the proposed ones that we're really kind of informing you a lot about tonight, you get to $31.6 million. So what does that mean? How, do you pay, how are we going to pay for that? Well, essentially what we're talking about is paying it out of our cash reserves. So if you go back to kind of really before the pool, we started paying for the pool, back to uh, fiscal year 17, uh, we had a fund balance when you, take out, when you take out early taxes of approximately $80 million. And so when you look at the, the, all the projects that we're talking about to be paid out of those reserves, so the pool and parking at 22.5 million, the proposed construction at LHS for the old renovate, renovating the old pool at five million, and then the proposed construction for Vernon Hills at 26.6, you get a total of 54.1 million dollars. So you take 80 minus 54.1, and we get to 25.9 million dollars uh, remaining fund balance when this is all said and done. So how, what, what does that mean? How do you give context to 25 million dollars? What that does is what that essentially means is that is a 30 percent. Fund balance is a percentage of our operating expenditures. So the money that we have to spend year in, year out to operate the district, to run, to pay teachers, to turn the lights on, all of that, that, that amount of money represents about 30% of that. So in, in, uh, as Dr. Lee had mentioned earlier, ISBE, the Illinois State Board of Education, which tells us a lot of the things that we have to do, uh, their, uh, their, their recommended minimum balance is 25%. Uh, so just to give context to that. Um, then there's these other things that I wanted to bring to you is we have opportunity to not spend money. So I'm going to talk to you about the money that we would like to not spend tonight. Uh, first is uh, inflation or escalation costs. Um, if we miss this construction cycle and we can't start construction until next spring, um, 
the idea is that the costs go up. There's inflation, there's escalation with construction. And then talking with our experts, maybe it's a range of four to, four to six percent based on the 31.6 million that we're proposing to do because the pool doesn't count because, or the, the, the new pool doesn't count because that's already bid and done. There's no inflation or escalation in there. But the stuff that we're proposing could go up if we don't, if we don't go out to bid at this point and we wait a year. You're talking anywhere from a range of 1.3 to $2 million a year based on a four to six percent escalation cost. And we, that's something that we would like to avoid, that we have the opportunity to, to avoid, and we would like to take advantage of that. Uh, the second thing that we would like to avoid that we can is uh, to not borrow money. So if you were looking at these projects and you were needing to borrow $54 million <coughs> to pay for these, which, um, by the way, so I, I don't know if I, I've met, haven't met many of you. This is my second year at the district. Dr. K and I are in our sophomore year in employment with the district. This is a wonderful district. This is a beautiful district. This is a very fortunate district. And um, not a lot of districts are able to fund projects without having to borrow money. It's pretty common that you have to borrow the money to be able to afford to pay for it. Similar to most people when you're buying a house, you don't really have all that money up front, so you've got you to borrow money and pay the mortgage on that. So we have the opportunity to, to avoid that. Now, Dr. Lee was right. If you look at the math, right, on, on a 30-year mortgage, if you're looking at it, at the end of the day, you've basically paid for your house three times. Well, because of how borrowing with schools works, we really only go about 20 years. So it's not quite as high, but you almost really double what you're spending. So in order to get 54 million, you'd have to pay out like 100 million. So really what we're avoiding is about, I truly think conservatively, $50 million of interest that we have the opportunity to avoid and we would like to take advantage of that. Uh, the third is, what about if you split or deferred some of these? What if you said, you know what, let's 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 do the let's let's hold off on the cap, let's hold off on the cafeteria, let's do that later, or do something else like that? <clears throat> well, because you know there are three different parts in the building, we have an opportunity of economies of scale that we can do. So because we're doing the three different projects and we're putting them together, we're buying more steel at one time, so we can get we can get the steel cheaper because we're buying in bigger quantities. Also, the trades are already on site, so they can work out. The electricians go to this spot and then they go to this spot. So they're already on site, which is super helpful. The other thing is, I love our design professionals, but if we split this out and defer it, then we have to pay them to come back, even though you're, you're worth it, I'm sure. We have to pay them to come back and we would like to pay them for a shorter period of time if we can. So those are, those are things that we just wanna take into consideration of, again, three areas of cost that we have the opportunity to avoid <laughs> that not, all, not always you're able to do that. And that's something that we would like to take advantage of. Um, so to summarize, what we're proposing at this point tonight is uh, at Vernon Hills additions, 26.6 million. Expand the cafeteria, classroom addition, gym and dance facility. At LHS, proposing renovating the old pool at 5 million. All paid from cash reserves, no referendum, no borrowing money, uh, no tax increase to pay for this. So that's... In a nutshell, really what we're talking about tonight is really kind of this slide in total. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Lee. Great, and, thanks uh, Dan. We've got the meetings up there for you. Great. <laughs> See if I can get back on here. Test, test, okay, there we go. So that's our overview for this evening, but uh, I wanna hit a couple of uh, high points here and uh, as you go through this process, um, you know, we'll often get questions, either people talk to us individually or they call us or um, they email us along the way. So um, a few things. Um, several people have said, you know, we, we don't wanna spend our tax dollars on, on a few kids in the dance program. And the dance programs are vibrant at both schools as, you, as you've heard tonight, okay? So we have multiple sections of physical education and dance during the day as part of our curricular program. And then we have large numbers of students um, who are involved in co- uh, and extracurricular activities. And just to give you an idea of that, and some of these students will certainly be crossovers, but I use my own two daughters as an example, who graduated from LHS. They both went through all of the PE dance levels that they go through, and neither one of them were in competitive dance. So we have a number of those students as well. But roughly about 20% of our student, total student population is doing some form of dance and uh, again that could be through uh, physical education curriculum that could be through one of our competitive dance teams that could be through our orchestras programs um, at uh, both schools 
And that could be part of the musical, because as we know, there, are dan there is dancing in musicals. Okay, so uh, we have large numbers of students that are involved in these programs. So the other thing I want to let you know uh, tonight is the majority of those students are female, okay? And we have an obligation, both, moral and eth both morally and ethically, but also legally, to ensure that we are treating those young ladies the same as we were tr are, are treating our male students, that we're providing um, you know, appropriate for facilities for them to practice and compete in. Uh, in fact, uh, we've been told by district council that we would certainly have some Title IX entanglements. Title IX is really what um, you know, guides that and enforces that at a federal level, that uh, equal access and equal treatment uh, in programs in public schools. <clears throat> Let me frame it for you this way. If we ask the football team at Libertyville High School to practice on the basketball floor every day, do you think we'd get a reaction from the community to that? Okay, what we do with the girls, what we have to do with the girls at both schools and some of the boys who are also involved in those programs is they are actually our nomads in both of the buildings. We have to move those students around day to day. They are never in a facility that is built for and designed for dance, okay? With appropriate flooring, with appropriate ceiling height, for throws and lifts, and also with mirrors on the wall, which any dance studio um, would have. So when you're thinking about dance, okay, think about the football team practicing on the basketball floor every day in the gym, okay? So that's really where we're at. Now, let's say for a minute, going to Dan's point, that we said, you know what, we're not gonna do either one of the dance studios. Guess what, we still are going to have to deal with the issue of what are we going to do to accommodate our female students in the physical education program and in our co and extracurricular activities within our existing facilities? Okay, uh, and obviously we don't have the facilities at this time at either building to be able to do that. So to do this with existing construction, um, when we can take an existing facility and we're repurposing it, and um, we are planning on building the second competitive gym at Vernon Hills, and we already built a locker room with the steel to support, you know, a third of a second floor to have a dance studio um, makes perfect sense. So that's important to know. Uh, it's also been suggested, it was suggested at, at last week's meeting, that we just don't do special education. Okay? Uh, and here's what I want to say to that. Okay? Again. In the community that we live in here, in, in, in the communities that we live, with the resources that we have in this community, okay, moral and ethically, morally and ethically, would we not, okay, even if there wasn't federal law that required us to do that, would we turn those kids away from going to public school in these communities? I don't think so. Okay, now, if you don't believe that, then we can go down this path. There is a whole batch of federal legislation that's called IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which requires us to provide um, services um, to uh, students that have special needs. And so when John and Tom talk about growing numbers in special education, that's a trend across the country. Uh, it's also a trend in our local area, and it's also a trend in our, in our feeder districts. So those costs have to be accommodated because they are often in smaller classrooms, and so our student-to-staff ratio uh, that goes with that uh, is very important, okay? So just wanna make sure that we get that out uh, on the table because honestly, there may be some people that don't realize that there's federal legislation that's really driven through the state um, that's enforced by the federal government that requires us to provide those services for our young people, whether it's a, <clears throat> Uh, a relatively um, um, uh, lesser learning disability or it's uh, students that are uh, severe and profound. We have an obligation to meet those needs. Um, the next thing um, <clears throat> was suggested last week is we just don't transport kids to school anymore. And if you're aware of state law in Illinois, anybody, any student that lives one and a half miles or further from the student attendance center in this state, we are required to bus them to school. 
Okay, and there's been recent legislative changes uh, that would actually allow students to be bused inside that 1.5 uh, mile uh, parameter if there were either uh, traffic or rail uh, hazards. Uh, and now legislation has been added for students that may live in a very dangerous neighborhood uh, that would normally have to walk through the school and let's say walk through a couple of different gang affiliate na neighborhoods to get to school uh, now have the opportunity to be transported. It's a fixed cost and it's a cost that we build into um, our budget um, every year. So Dan talked a little bit about kind of the cost of, of waiting, okay, in terms of construction inflation. How many of you have either had a student in college, you have a student in college, or you will have a student in college? Just raise your hand. Okay, you check your year-over-year -year tuition bill. I know Lisa Stone does up there, okay? And college tuition kind of goes up from 5 to 6% every year, right? It's, if inflation's 0.7, tuition goes up 0.6 every single year, okay? Construction inflation is very similar. So we talk about the cost of waiting. I, I am also a taxpayer in the district, okay? None of us wants to spend good money after bad when we could have done it on the front side. But here's something that uh, actually Scott and I were talking a little bit about uh, before the meeting tonight. But if you're a Tribune reader, did anybody see the article about Hinsdale High School District 86 that was in the paper today? One of the best high school districts in the state, some of the oldest big money in the Chicago area in Hinsdale. And Hinsdale 86 board announced Monday night that it's cutting football, band, cheerleading, dance, swimming uh, from their program. How can that be at, at a district like that? What's happened in that particular district is they put off their capital needs for so long that now they have to pass a referendum at about 146 million scaled back to do all of 146 million to do all of their capital work. And so in order to scale back a referendum that they lost in the fall, they are going to have to pass a smaller referendum at 146 million. And the result of that is they've announced that they're cutting programs, okay? So what our board has done historically here, certainly over the past 12 or 15 years here, is they've done a great job of planning forward and looking kind of 15 years down the line. And really that's what the boards, the boards here, plural, began to do uh, approximately seven years ago. Um, we had a place where we, were gonna, we knew we were gonna be uh, paying off some bonds and that uh, created a gap in space for us to start to look at what our capital needs were going forward. So many of the things that Hinsdale, for example, that they have on their list of things to do, okay, security, advanced security in their buildings, we've already done, okay. Um, forward uh, wiring technology in their buildings, we've already done. A uh, number of those things we've been able to do because we had a capital plan on cycle and we've used existing reserves to be able to do that. So that's one other thing uh, to keep in mind kind of on the cost of waiting. If you put things off too long, then you have to borrow money. And if you can't borrow as much you need to do as all those things and you have to make significant cuts um, from other places. Two other things and then I'm, I'm gonna close and then we'll uh, open this up to uh, questions from uh, everyone. That sometimes people in the community are not aware if, you know, maybe you're not reading the newspaper every day, but um, you know, over a five year window in this district, the school board abated. And in our world, that means not collected $18.5 million of property taxes it could have collected. It's the, it's the largest property tax abatement over five years in the history of the state of Illinois. Okay, $18.5 million the district could have collected based on the referendum the district passed 20 years ago to build Vernon Hills and do some work here at Libertyville, uh, and the board abated that money and did not collect it. The second thing, and I'll just speak at district office, that um, we've done over the three years, last three years, is through attrition and retirement, I've recommended the board the reduction of five full-time positions at the district office level. So we've reduced 20% of the district level staff at a savings of $520,000 per year. Now in our world, we always multiply times 10. So if you take that number and you multiply times 10, you're gonna get another number. But over that 10 years, there would, there would be salary inflation. So that number's even gonna be um, higher. And we've worked with John and Tom very closely and Marina Scott before Tom, and we've really held our, our building budgets very tight 
uh, over the last few years. As John has, John has noted, did a great job with, uh, the numbers are going to keep climbing. Um, we are at 1,500, which nobody could fathom several, I mean, probably even five years ago. Um, we know we're going to hit 1,600 probably in the next couple of years. And then as John indicated, the question is, do we hit 17 or 1,800 um, moving forward with some of the development um, in the district? So again, that planning forward um, is very important in this process. Um, when we plan for the classrooms, John talked about, really the architects talked about probably 12 to 16 classrooms, and a conversation with the board was, let's do, let's do the eight in the STEM lab, and then every year we'll review our demographic numbers and our real numbers, faces to names, uh, as John has indicated. And then if we need to add four more classrooms for a couple years down the line, uh, we'll we'll uh, be able to do that with the two-year turnaround that we need to do for uh, construction. So um, the board has done a lot of work on this and a number of board members, okay, and I iterations of boards over the several years, and uh, the boards have all come to the same conclusion. Okay, um, there's a rationale to do, um, you know, what we're proposing to do. Okay, um, the time is right. We have the... Um, resources to be able to do that and not wait and cost us more um, as taxpayers. So we appreciate your patience as we went through uh, the presentation tonight. And again, I just remind us as we kind of go into question and answer that if you have other things you want to talk to the board about, budget, levy, you know, other issues kind of beyond this, um, we would ask you to come to a regular board meeting because this is not a regular board meeting tonight, okay? Uh, and then just if you can keep your comments to three-ish minutes or so, um, um, then I think that gives everybody an opportunity to chat, okay? So, um, Bryant Kelly is uh, our Mr. Microphone tonight. Now, the reason we have to have a microphone for those of you that are shy and you say, well, I just want to shout my question out, uh, we're taping the presentation tonight, um, and then uh, we taped the presentation of Vernon Hills last week, and after those are closed captioned to meet the Americans with Disability Act, We'll be posting those up, and so we have to have you on microphone because the sound is fed right in uh, to the filming tonight, okay? Um, so if you could just tell us who you are and uh, where you're from and what your question is, that'd be great. Um, okay. And I already know Greg, so Greg, you introduce yourselves yeah, to Yeah, Greg everyone. Franz, Libertyville. I was at the meeting last week, and... Uh, i just like to well, a little we need clarification. To I was at the answer. meeting, and I didn't hear that someone suggested that we would uh, not have special ed, nor did I actually hear they said, let's eliminate transportation. There was discussions about what was the cost of per, per student, and then they were talking, breaking it down between special ed and normal. And, but I didn't see anyone say, hey, eliminate special ed, nor did I hear them say, let's eliminate transportation. They were asking about the cost of transportation. So I'd appreciate if we weren't, we weren't so disingenuous when presenting what happened last week to this, this crew. Um, Greg, I thing, think we just, I, that, that, not that, to disagree with you, I think we just heard that different and we're okay. gonna see a tape pretty soon and. That, that, that's okay, fine, it'll great. be out there, but I appreciate I, if we would. I'll yeah. just speak to yeah, something here. Go ahead. Um, that was asked of me also after the presentation was over um, when people left. So right, I wanted was, to make sure that was clarified. Okay, okay, that, that's better. It wasn't in the public forum, thank you. Um, one other question. Uh, the other thing, last week it was presented that the state uh, minimum suggested reserve was 20 percent. Now I'm hearing 25 percent. Can you clarify that for me, please? Yeah. So yeah, I don't I don't know if it was unclear. I I don't remember exactly the conversation uh, last week. But so ISBE has a financial profile ranking, and so what they do is if the district has less than 25 percent fund balance, you give a lower rating. So that is an inferred minimum requirement of 25 percent from the state. Right, but I, I heard 20% because I, I brought up the issue that we were 50% over the minimum and it wasn't brought up with any sort of objection. But let's continue. Um, the, one other thing I want to do up there is uh, about a general comment is one of the advantages of, of having the cash was no referendum. Uh, who's that an advantage for? Is that for the board or is that for our taxpayers? Just a general comment. All right, one other question now about, about finances. Can you tell me about, over the last five years, Ballpark average, what was the surplus from the operating budget uh, that, was, that was possibly contributing to reserves, more or less? Uh, sorry, I'm hearing a, a couple of questions. I'm not sure, do you want them answered or not? 
Which one? You'd asked about the, the referendum. So the idea of a referendum yeah. is, you know, typically if a district has to borrow money, the, the board is not allowed to unilaterally decide to obligate the taxpayers of the community for whatever they want. So they require to ask the permission to borrow the money. This is a situation where there is no need to ask to borrow the money because that's just not, that's not necessary. No, and I was point. just saying it was brought up as a benefit of having all the cash reserves, and I said it's a benefit probably more for the district than the taxpayers. Taxpayers, it, that's, that's my opinion, of course, okay? Let's proceed. So on average, the last five years, more or less, I'm just curious of what, what the operating surplus was uh, from our, that the contributed reserves Per year, yeah. Per year, yeah. yeah so, more or less. A, a, yeah, so it's my sophomore year here. I don't know exactly all the history of the five years, but I know the last couple are somewhere in the range of a few, a few million dollars. Okay. And then out of those, okay, go ahead. Yeah, okay. go ahead, Scott. I, I want to, I, th I think it's helpful just to understand kind of the philosophy that the board has as it relates to budgets. So, this is my fourth year as being on the board, and it's been a heck of a learning experience. Every year that I've been on it, we go through, and roughly the budget, the operating budget for the district is $80 million. That's what's spent in a given year, 70% of that is teachers. Our goal going through a budget exercise every year is simple. Revenues that we get in equal expenditures. We don't plan on a yearly basis to run a surplus. What I have found and what I've learned working with these awesome people, these folks do a great job at estimating every year what they spend, okay? Where we typically miss is what revenues we get from the taxing bodies. So that's local through property taxes. That's through the state, which is, I'll just use the word volatile right now, and maybe a little screwed up, and then a little bit, not much from the federal side, but some, mm -hmm. okay? What typically doesn't match up all the time that might get you a million or two million dollar surplus, which is not planned for, is timing coming from the state or calculations that don't come up. We have tend, tended to be a little bit conservative on what we think we're going to get from the state or from funding sources, so sometimes that comes up a little bit higher. But the goal of the board has been simple. Revenues equal expenses balanced budgets. And if there is a surplus, then it goes to the reserves that we talk about. But that has never been the goal is to run these up year over year. It's been an artifact, again, of revenues and expenses and how good it, we are at predicting them. And we're really good on the expense side and not so good sometimes on the revenue because it's outside of our control. Fair enough. Thank you. Thanks. But now but back to the question, so let's just say it's a million to two million. The bonds in the debt service for Vernon Hills High School was paid off in 2017. Uh, is that correct, more or less? Yeah, it might have been fiscal year 17, 18. Right, and, and that, that capital, the, those bonds and that interest uh, um, payment came out of operating expenses. Is that a fair assumption, not out of reserves? Incorrect. No. Okay. Reserves. Always it, reserves. Well, I mean, not, no, no, tr truly not always reserves, not always operating. So some years it was all reserves. Some year it was a combination. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the, that's the answer. Okay. Okay. So then I'll ask the question is approximately during those five years, and I'm not looking for the whole thing about what was debt service and the, the capital that, that went to pay off those bonds. Cause that money should be freed up from reserves or from operating expenses, because it's no longer on the books anymore, and, and that two million should move to, if it's five million per year, yeah. should move, because you said 54 million, and I'm yeah. sure Vernon Hills High School costs more than 54 million. So all that money should be freed up either from reserves or from operating expenses, or from, from the operating budget, um, that really hasn't been out there in the, in, in the most recent uh, um, uh, past, correct? Sure, so the debt payment, uh, when the district had bonds, would range depending on interest schedule and everything, approximately five to six million a year. Um, so once that debt went off, and, that, and that's the thing about the referendum, so the question is, is who, who benefits from the referendum? Well, typically, again, a referendum says, we want to increase your taxes to pay for this. 
This is not the situation that we're facing. So what happened when they built Vernon Hills and that referendum was passed, that referendum was to increase the taxes to pay for that. So when those, when that, and, and you know, once that happens, it gets filed with the county and kind of set it and forget it kind of thing. But so what happens is when that debt is paid off, the taxes go away as well. So in theory, it's, it, that, it, it won't work exactly, but in theory, you have, a, you have about a five to six million dollar tax for that debt payment that went away two is, years ago. Is that the abatement we're talking about that we're hanging our hat on saying how we, we didn't take it because that was the, the, the decrease in taxes? What I'm getting to is right now is the fact that it seems like, it, it, and, I, and I'll, I'll let it go, but, but the idea is, is that there's a chunk out here. I'm seeing that there was a tax decrease. I didn't necessarily see it when this thing was paid off. There's an abatement that's out there, and I, I, I get that component of it. But now, it, you know, I'll, I'll follow up with you guys later. I sure. sent an email to you asking about some information, and I'll, I'll follow up with you later. But I'm just concerned about that big chunk of cash that was going out of here, whether it was reserves or whether it was operating income, is now freed from this, for this community and should not be going into reserves. And, and hopefully, yeah. we get something of it coming back to the Yeah, community. I'm happy to show you. And it, it definitely, once, the, once it was you. paid off, the taxes went down from that not, not being there anymore, for sure. Yeah. Let me speak just a, a bit about, I was on the board at the point in time that whole process started. The, the amount of taxes taken out of your, that, that you pay for that referendum is a separate line item on your tax bill. There's a X number of dollars for that to go to pay that six, seven million dollar, whatever it was, payment each year. About seven years ago now, I think, mm -hmm. uh, we made a decision that, okay, we had, some reserves here, some, some uh, cash balance in the, uh, that we could use to really help the taxpayers out. And what we, our intent was, was to level our tax payments, the, the, the monies that we receive from the taxpayers in its district, was to level that out so it doesn't increase. And how we did that was a couple things. One is we said, okay, we're gonna start paying a part of that mortgage payment, call it a mortgage payment, that separate line item on your tax bill. We're gonna start paying a part of that mortgage payment out of our reserves so that the taxpayer doesn't have to do that. So that's the abatement. We're saying, okay, your mortgage payment's going down this year. So we did that in a gradual basis so that by the time we were getting ready to, to finalize that, that last payment, we were paying all of that payment out of the reserves. So you were not paying any of that yourselves. We were abating the full amount. And so in essence, the last year of our mortgage for Vernon Hills and the renovations here was paid for out of the reserves. Once that, that process is done, then that payment on your tax bill goes away. So there's no extra money that we receive that goes somewhere. And it was actually deducted from the reserves that were in, the, in place. The other piece of the, that puzzle was along that process as well. We did an abatement on our operating funds. That decreases the other line item on your tax bill that goes to pay all our operations. And that was, I believe, 1.2 million or something component of that. So that comes off, and that comes off forever. So that reset what we take from in terms of taxes. So over that five year span, it equated about $18.5 million, but there are, is a portion of that that has an ongoing residual effect that uh, f forever, you know, in terms of what we can collect in taxes. So that was our intent though, was to keep payments of taxpayer dollars to keep your, your payments level for as long as we could keep them level without, you know, uh, uh, while taking advantage of being able to pay off that mortgage earlier. Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, first off, you know, we just had the deadline Monday for people to file to run for this board, and I want to take a moment to thank our neighbors, and that, that's who is serving. That's who we're talking about here. I want to thank all of our neighbors here for putting your name out there again and being willing to do this. Take your time, volunteer to take this heat and to, to manage our money well, and I'm deeply grateful for that. I want to thank not just the board, but the district for being concerned to meet our students' needs. When I hear that children within my school district have 22 minutes for lunch, that breaks my heart. That's, that's unacceptable, and, and I'm glad you guys are doing something about it. Um, I think you're being good stewards of our tax dollars. Um, I'm really glad to hear that you have the reserve to do these projects. 
and you're not coming to us to try and borrow to do this. Um, I think that's being fiscally responsible. Um, you often get to hear from us what we don't like from you guys, and that's our role also, to keep you guys, um, keep you all apprised of what we think you're doing right, what we think you're doing wrong. I just want to take this moment to say thank you. Thank you for being visionaries. And as a taxpayer in this community, I fully support this effort. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Up, oh, we have one right there, Mr. Kelly, in the middle. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name's Casey Dugan. I'm the LHS Varsity Dance Team Coach, um, and I've been coaching the program for seven years. Um, I want to take a moment to also thank the board and the admin for seeing the need um, for not only the dance studio, but for all of your efforts at Vernon Hills and at Libertyville. Um, as educators and as coaches, our hope and our goal is to have a positive impact on all of these students' lives. Um, but above everything else, their safety is our biggest, um, our main concern. And we currently practice in a space that is not safe for their needs. Um, we're between a cafeteria floor um, and a link crew room that um, does not meet their needs as athletes or as a dance program and curriculum here. So thank you to the board and the community um, and the administration for seeing the need and seeing and putting our students and our athletes first. Come in here. Question. Hi, um, my name is Julie Towns Stevenson, um, class of 1990, and the orange carpet was here when I left too. <laughs> um, I also have a student here who is in the dance programs, um, both in the curriculum and extracurricular dance programs here. I'm a former dance program member myself, um, and I also have been an owner of a local dance school here in the community, of which there are six, both government, park district programs, and private dance schools in this community. I personally, in the last six years, have had three students um, at my school who have injured themselves in the dance programs at this high school right here on inappropriate floors whether it be a cafeteria, a concrete floor, the link crew room, et cetera. Um, the dance injuries that have come from being on inappropriate floors and extracurricular activities here, um, I think has been a problem for a long time. And I really support that you guys are um, taking some initiative to try to re um, remedy that. Also, um, being a business owner, I have approximately 400 students at my school and we operate 90 hours a week in four studios with 400 students. So if you say 20% of your district, I'm assuming 20% of the student population here at LHS is somewhere around 200 to, 200 to 400 students. I operate four studio dance studio spaces 90 hours a week with that number of students. So to have one space would be outstanding. I mean, it would be a step in the right direction. So I fully support and thank you to all the board members um, for all the work that you do. I know you're all over this room um, for all the work that you do. So, thanks. Hi, my name is Tim McCrory. Um, I wanted to thank you as well. This is a great presentation, very helpful, very simple for a person like me to understand. And, um, and I appreciate the foresight and the long-term planning you're putting into this. Um, I'm also supportive of these renovations initiatives. I have a daughter on, on the competition dance team as well. I thought it might be helpful for the board. Um, I did some information gathering and reached out to a number of schools, high schools all around the area. And I've got some handouts I'll give to you guys afterwards if you're interested. But um, just a real quick summary, I contacted all the schools in our conference. There's eight of them. Uh, Mundelein didn't get back to me, but every other school does have an in-school dance studio with the exception of Waukegan. Um, I contacted all the schools in our sectional, so that's 16 schools. Um, three didn't get back to me, three don't have studios, two of the three are private schools, Carmel and St. Ignatius, so those aren't, not exactly apples to apples comparisons, but uh, the vast majority do. The one public school that didn't was Lakes, but all the rest mm -hmm. did have studios in the school. Um, I reached out to all the schools that finished in the top 12 in the state, all but one have a dance studio in the school. And then I have a, a chart with a bunch of other schools that are just communities like ours with competitive dance teams and uh, you know, areas like Libertyville. So hopefully that'll be helpful. Um, I also appreciate 
seeing the, the thought that's going into the floor for the proposed dance studio. There's a lot of information out there, as, as Chu was just saying, about injuries, as al also um, how bad floors can just take years of longevity off a dancer's life. So I appreciate the thought going into that as well. Thanks. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah, Jeff will come back up to you then, okay. Rod bus class of 70, we didn't have a swimming pool, and you can see what happens. <laughs> um, uh, two questions. Um, one is uh, uh, an easy one, maybe for you to answer. Was the board unanimous in supporting the capital uh, budget? And the other question is kind of related to something Jerry Brown said to the, uh, the uh, governor when he uh, gave advice to the new governor. He said, prepare for the worst. And um, you know, we talked briefly before the meeting, Jim and uh, Prentice, about uh, how Libertyville Township is pretty lucky to have a, a good, low, a relatively low tax rate. You have pretty good income, um, but it doesn't always. You know, Hinsdale you alluded to, Zion lost a nuclear power plant. Um, are you confident that the income stream we have that allows us to have this low tax rate is going to continue? Uh, as to the question of was the board unanimous? I believe so. The budget that the yes. board approved took it into account, I believe it was unanimous, that that budget was approved. It was unanimous. Yeah. There you go. Uh, but Jerry, you, uh, uh, Rod, you asked about the, but if the board was unanimous on the capital planning, right? Yes. Yeah, moving forward to the proposal stage, yes. Yeah, but to be clear, the, the ones that are proposed are not board approved to like bid, you know, that, that is not done yet, to be clear. So I just wanted to just be clear about where that is. Uh, then in terms of the income stream, you know, um, the, the state law, so is, is, are you sure it, it all depends, you know, we have a variety of taxpayers in our district, both corporate, industrial, and everything like that. Um, we're, you know, we're not aware of any major changes happening there, um, but truly that somewhat of an unknown. Um, now, if they did make big changes, you know, there are, no, there are, there are requirements for notifications of things like that to happen, um, but that would, that would be a truthful answer. We've been, I think, you know, I've been here, I think this is my 15th year. Um, we're, we've been fortunate to be very stable here, right? Um, part of the um, kind of the run up before the real estate crash, there was a lot of corporate development in the area. Uh, you know, HSBC built their facility out on the, on the tollway. It's now AbbV is, is in there. Uh, we have all the development in the office park around our district office across in Vernon High Schools, right? So CDW is there. So we have a good corporate presence. And in Illinois, we have just about the perfect um, mix of taxes in the district to fund a school district, for example, because we've got a good sp spread of residential uh, housing, and we've got uh, a really nice spread of kind of corporate industrial um, and retail uh, moving forward. So that gives us a pretty a broader um, tax base than a community. We were talking about Grays Lake, for example, which is heavily residential. So tax taxes are very high there because just homeowners are carrying the majority of the tax burden there where it is spread out. Having Abbott in our school district is, you know, a blessing for the school district and, and certainly the area with jobs and and those kinds of things. So we've been very fortunate, and I would concur with Dan. We don't see any major changes there. Uh, as we know, they're still doing development in the area. I mean, you look at Vernon Hills and the Melody Farm area. Now, that's on a TIF for 21 years, uh, but eventually it will come off a TIF uh, at some point. Um, the um, in uh, several meetings with folks at Vernon Hills, the developers are committed to redeveloping the mall area to projects like other malls that are being successful with a mix of, you know, standalone restaurants, housing, uh, various housing, uh, that kind of stuff. So it seems like there's a commitment to do that. And then we still have residential development, you know, going on in the district, you know, surprisingly, on any pieces of land they can find that. So uh, John mentioned, somebody mentioned Cuneo earlier, the development over there, um, you know, um, housing that they'll have at Melody Farm if they do some housing at the mall. And then uh, kind of normal turnover of housing stock, right? And so part of what's going on in Vernon Hills is, um, you know, some of the um, kind of stable areas that have been there for a long time are finally turning over where people own their houses for 30 years. 
Now the real estate market's a, you know, better than it was in 2008, right? When we kind of hit the wall and people are selling their houses and young families are coming in to our, all of our communities, you know, Green Oaks, you know, part of Mundelein we have, you know, the Rondout Metawa area, and of course, Libertyville and Vernon Hills, because it's a great place to raise kids, right? Good schools, you know, safe towns, great park districts, all of those things. So all the fundamentals in our communities are, are really good. And, you know, I think I could say on behalf of all of our board, we are just as concerned about property taxes as all of you because we all live here too. Um, and, um, you know, we had a pretty nice conversation before the, the board meeting uh, tonight. So it, that is something that we talk about repeatedly. And if you know Pat Grudy, the board president for a number of years here, Pat is always the first one to say, you know, look at my tax bill, okay? You know, we've, we've got to pay attention to this. So those conversations are going to continue to happen. And what we're trying to do is leverage an opportunity in a time where we've got some real need and we happen to have the resources and we're not going to have to come back later and spend more on those projects because we waited and then have to try and borrow the money and pay the interest to do it. So it's kind of almost like an alignment of the moons um, at uh, some point. So, um, Jeff, why don't you go ahead and then I'll, we'll see if anybody else and I'll, I want to just remind people at the end when the upcoming meetings are and what the timeline okay. is. So. My name is Jeff Brown. I'm an 18-year faculty member in District 128. I teach at Libertyville High School. Uh, I so appreciate Casey being here and the people that have spoken on behalf of our varsity dance team. I'm going to stand up and speak on behalf of the other dance activities that happen, specifically the 150 students that my wife sitting right here teaches in our curricular dance classes every single day, and the students in our theater program and orchestras who um, uh, don't compete, but uh, dance at an extracurricular uh, uh, activities in the fall, musical theater in the fall, orchestras in the spring. Uh, th these facilities are, are so needed, and they have been needed since my wife started working here in 2004. Uh, Prentice's statement about dance being the nomads of the school couldn't be more accurate. They have no place to be. They're dancing on floors that are not uh, safe. <clears throat> and just to have, as, as you stated, to have one safe space for every single dancer in this whole school to be on, while it would be a blessing, it's still not going to be enough. So uh, on behalf of fine arts, on behalf of curricular dance that uh, my wife teaches every day in the West Gym, the, the gym that John wants at Vernon Hills, that's my wife's classroom every single day. That's where her mirrors are that she rolls out into the middle of the floor and has to roll back when her class is over, and her ballet bars that she has to carry out in the middle of the floor, and her tap squares so that kids can do tap dance and, and, and make, her, make her art work in the middle of this competitive gym. Um, it, it, we need this space so bad at Libertyville High School. I, I can't even express that to people who aren't in the building on a daily basis and don't see the space constraints that we have. I can't imagine what they are at Vernon Hills because we have them here. So thank you all for, that are here that are in support of this. We're here with you, and we approve board. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff will make uh, you know, just one comment. First of all, kudos to Erin because she does a f phenomenal job. Um, and um, I think John and Tom have both, point, both pointed out that we actually have limitations Okay, it would be like in the math curriculum, we could do algebra and geometry and maybe algebra two and trig, but we didn't have a classroom to do calculus, pre-calculus and calculus. It's, it's really kind of the analogy with the academic program. And we could have more, we've got things we can't do in dance-related programs because we don't have the space. I also know, because I worked very uh, intimately in scheduling here when I was in Brian's job as associate my first three years here that we could have a lot more dance sections at both schools but we can't offer those sections it's one of the few things at our two high schools that we actually have to limit we can only take so many nope that's it it's capped off even if there's more interest and more need so uh, pre appreciate those comments but also the job that you do and your colleague does at Vernon Hills because you do an amazing job in the dance programs Okay, uh, we, Bryant's right here, I think. Hi, everyone. I'm Gigi. I'm a senior at LHS, and 
just sitting through this meeting, I've seen how much like our board cares about us and our principals and our faculty. And I have been in dance classes at LHS. I've been on the dance team. I've been in orchestras. And it's really awesome to see a safe and clean place that will be made for different dance programs because I know that a lot of people on my team and in these programs will appreciate it a lot. So thank you. Great. Okay, we, we about done. Just uh, close up, Dan, if you, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. I, I'm sorry, I didn't see you get the mic. Um, hi, I'm Kelly Higgison. I'm a three-year varsity member and a captain this year. And again, we just want to thank the board for all the effort they've put in to help fix this and just accommodate the needs for all the other dancers. And I know this won't benefit us anytime soon. We're happy with knowing that it's going to benefit the program and the rest of the dance programs and things that will go on at the school. That's great. Okay, Dan, would you put uh, advance the slide for me, please? Okay, so uh, let's talk about timeline, just to review the timeline again. So for us to hit our construction timeline, the board will need to uh, vote on the projects to go to bid in at our January board meeting, okay? If the board votes on the proposed projects and we go out to bid, then the next step is they have to award the bids, and that's when it gets r for real, okay? Um, and uh, that would happen at our February meeting, which would allow us uh, to begin to hit construction cycles to uh, at both buildings so we can get shovels in the ground as we talk about and we can move start moving those projects forward so here are some other opportunities for you to either pay attention through information that we put out or actually to come to board committee or board meetings so on Monday January 14th the board has its normal committee meetings the F&F or facilities and finance meeting is at 5:30. And that's followed whenever F&F is over. It's usually 6.30-ish. Um, um, then uh, program of personnel um, meeting happens after that. Our uh, January board meeting where the board would actually need to decide to bid the projects out if they're going to do that uh, is Tuesday, January 29th, 2019, board meeting, 7 o'clock. Uh, and that board meeting is at Vernon Hills High School in the library. <laughs> if you haven't been there before. Um, so then we turn the page to February, right? So um, if everything's a go up to that point, then Monday, February 11th, okay, we'll do an update or have some conversation about this again at the committee meetings at FNF at 530. And then Monday, February 25th is the regular board meeting and that's at 7 p.m., okay? Now all of that's on the website under the board tab, but um, Mary left some cards out front that uh, you should start getting at home either today or maybe tomorrow. Um, we're uh, going to give you another way to plug in with the school district and the community to plug in with the school district. Um, and uh, by signing up, going through the process to sign up, you will then get notifications from the school. So for example, when a board committee meetings are coming up or board meetings are coming up, you'll get a notice. Some of you that, you know, if you pay attention to Village Business and Libertyville and Vernon Hills, they use a similar model. Uh, and then, you know, you will have access to the board agenda and any supporting documents uh, as long as it's not an executive session thing uh, moving forward. So it just gives you another way to plug in. And then, of course, you would get any announcements from, you know, the school. You would get our e -paw prints, which is our weekly newsletter. Uh, you get e-board briefs after the board meeting uh, and any other significant documentation. So um, all 23,000 taxpaying addresses in the school district will receive that uh, report card or that uh, postcard that will uh, give you instructions uh, how to do that. Now we have a number of people that no longer have kids in the school that already kind of keep up with us, but this just kind of takes it and you know a next step further uh, in terms of notification and we hope you'll take uh, advantage of that. So with that said, if we don't have any other questions, we really appreciate um, you know, everyone coming out, and Greg, I think you get the prize because you came to both meetings, okay? So let's give Greg a round of applause. He came to both meetings, okay? Um, and uh, we really appreciate you coming out uh, and interacting with us. And again, uh, the board just wanted to take some extra steps to give the public an opportunity to come and see, touch and feel, outside of maybe the nor normal board structure, okay? Pardon? Seniors, 
members to please come back and visit the new dance studios? Uh, yeah, when we get the dance studio uh, done, assuming that we're going that direction at some point, uh, then uh, we would invite you all back to take a dance in the new facility, okay? All right, so thanks a lot. Appreciate you.